on my computer. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, happy Friday. Thanks so much for sharing your Friday evening with, with us. I'm so excited to be here. Um, in this call, we we have um, myself. Um, my name is Alejandro Ruiz. I'm with Local First Arizona. I'm the Small Business uh, Resource Coordinator. Um, and we also have Erica with Retail Therapy. And then I also have... Um, I also have Tim, Tim Castro, who is the director of business development, who is with also um, with Local First Arizona. Oops. So we'll get started um, with, oh, so so we'll get started with um, the presentation. I can see a couple people um, coming in still. Um, but yeah, we so we were Local First and we are collaborating with um, Retail Therapy and we wanted to create a space where we can um, where we can connect with you all and talk about different ways and how to maximize the vendor booth experience. I know I'm so excited for uh, for retail therapy and all the vendors as well too. But, um, getting ready to do all the markets, um, specifically the markets starting with Westgate at the end of at the end of May. And so um, I'll pass it to to Tim to take off the first the first couple of slides. Thanks. I'm gonna go ahead and put it into um, presentation mode. Oh. It's showing the sidebars. Oops. There we go. There we go. There. Perfect. <laughs> Um, folks, welcome everybody. Uh, if you have questions, we have a couple folks that are monitoring um, the chat. So please feel free to ask questions. This is designed to get the most um, from your experiences and what your questions are. I did see somebody post that they're dipping their toe in the in the booth waters. Um, Local First has been working with retail therapy to try to get as much knowledge from our our brains into the booth experience and we really just want to make sure that when you do a booth we understand it's a, it's a time commitment it's packing it's you know schlepping stuff back and forth it's giving up weekends so we completely understand all of those things and we just really want to make sure that you're very successful in these things so if you have questions or even after this presentation Alejandro and myself work with a team um, that is designed to help entrepreneurs um, uh, um, basically get the most um, resources available for them. And Local First, as a nonprofit, um, allows these resources um, to be, um, I don't want to say free, but pretty darn close to free. Um, so as we go through this, we're going to talk about, one, what does it mean to be in, in a market? Um, on online footprint, uh, booth engagement, uh, displaying techniques, uh, table examples, what's the best way to engage before, during, and after uh, you decide to do a booth, what booths do you decide to, to join, um, and of course, we know there's a lot of bad characters out there, so we are going to talk a little bit about, um, unfortunately, the scams that we're seeing populate, um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about, um, I'll add some stuff about AI scams, which are becoming more and more prevalent and absolutely uh, mockers in my book. Um, so like I said, if you just have any questions about that stuff, just please put them in the chat. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to the uh, next slide. Why is it not? Oh, there we go. So um, as, as Tim mentioned, right, we definitely want to um, ensure that we um, maximize the whole experience. And so I think one thing to to know is that whenever we go to markets as a vendor, we really have to think about, you know, not just what do we do during the um, the market, but also what do we do before the market and also after. And so we'll we'll dedicate the whole the whole presentation will kind of touch in um, in each in each part of the timeline. And so when we when we talk about what do we do before before the market? Um, again, it's also our the vendor's responsibility to to promote the market and increase the visibility so that way we we um, ultimately leads to more sales, right? And also how do we uh, build relationship with um, and engage with our potential um, customers? And so when um, when we 
talk about what to do before social media is super big, right? How do we engage with, with our clients before social media? So posting about our, our, our markets, where we're going to be at, maybe showing, um, showing pictures, locations, using hashtags would, um, you know, we can put like Westgate uh, for the, just for an example, the Westgate markets, retail therapy, uh, your own hashtags. And I know right now that, you know, we have a big holiday coming up on this Sunday that we can definitely start promoting as well, too. Another way is flyers, posters that we can be posting, uh, um, posting about. But again, it's getting it's um, getting the ball moving of like what what is it all that we can do so with that way we can promote um, our market as well or, and also our um, the yeah promoting our market and us and the vendor being there as well too. Is there anything that maybe you all do that's not on this on this list as well too? And please feel free to also get your. Um, to yourself off mic and, and chime in as well. I know that I know some of the, you all said that that you're new, but I know also that some of us are experts as well too. So I definitely want to hear your thoughts um, as well. So don't be shy, please. Um, one thing I know as an event coordinator, um, I know I constantly post on social media. Um, but if there's ever a chance that you do not receive a flyer from your event coordinator, um, you can always go to their social media and screenshot, crop it out so that it does not look like it was screenshot and utilize that flyer. It's important for you guys to get the content as quickly as possible. And you know, event coordinators are often dealing with lots of different vendors and lots of different um things that go along with planning the market. Uh, if you want to get ahead of the game, just go and grab that content from their social media um, and definitely utilize it as a resource to start posting. Um, we also post in Nextdoor um, to utilize the surrounding neighborhoods. That's a really good free resource for you to utilize to um, promote where you're going to be. Um, obviously, all of the different social media platforms, um, most of your website components will have a free email campaign that goes along with it. Um, so I know that Alejandra is going to talk about some ways to like build your um, community email list. So always let people know where you are. Yes. Yeah. And um, I love that, Erica, like definitely letting people know where you're where you're at and where you're going to be. Right. Um, I think super, super big. So when, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Is this one mine or yours? <laughs> <laughs> um, so your, your online footprint, and, and I say this with a grain of salt. Some of you love social media and you can engage on it all day long. Some of us wouldn't know a TikTok from a reel if it, if it slapped us in the head. So understanding these things and understanding that, um, who is your market for what social media channel you're on and how to best reach your market with your most valuable resource of time. Great example is um, absolutely every business, regardless of size, has to have a Google business profile. We can help set those up for you. And the main reason is Google gets billions of searches a day. Google allows, if you have a Google business page, it allows you to be seen and allows you to be found. So if you're in downtown Glendale or you're at the Westgate and you've got a business, it'll say, oh, this business, retail therapy, they're located pretty close to you. You typed in shops near me, local shops near me, female owned shops near me, depending on how you build your Google business profile, it'll allow you to be searched for somebody to kind of go through that. Um, I'd want to touch very, very softly on SEO. I'm sure you've all gotten phone calls and emails saying, hey, we would love to have you sit down with us and we will maximize your SEO. Give us $2,000 and we will get you on the first page. Um, take all of those things with a grain of salt. Um, we want to make sure that you're building your business and your audience for something that's relevant to you. A lot of times if you're... Um, online and all of a sudden you go viral and you want to, somebody ask for 5,000 widgets, uh, will you be able to do that? Can you fulfill the order? Like, what does your bandwidth look like? You're like, hey, this is a hobby. Um, uh, the last thing I want to do 
is being make 10,000 quilts. My aunt um, is in retirement and I ask her all the time, oh, Thea, if you just did this, you know, she's like, no, I just want to do this. And I, if I can sell one quilt uh, a year, I'll be happy. Um, so just kind of understand that as you're looking at how to best footprint yourself online, if you're uncomfortable being in front of the camera, um, go ahead and just video your, your product and take a voice of you just talking over your product. Um, Instagram right now is absolutely crushing it in sales for small business. It used to be Facebook. Facebook has really drawn down its impact. Right now, it's really just a platform for um, you know pictures of grandchildren, graduations, and vacations. We've really gone away from that uh, model of Hey, here's my marketplace. Great place for me to sell my stuff. It's it's just really kind of lost its audience. Best way to say that. And a lot of people just moved to Instagram. Instagram Reels are everywhere. They're very um, impactful. TikToks not really a great sales, but they're great branding. So if you are in a service industry, like let's say you are um, commercial cleaning or house cleaning taking a video before and after, um, those go a really long way um, when you're trying to get eyeballs on your work. If you are in clothing or unique items, you know, take a quick video of that and, and just post it. It's, it's part of your job now. If you own a booth or you're about to own a booth or you have a space in retail therapy, please consider owning your website, owning your footprint as part of your job two to five hours a week is good. It's gonna get you everything that you need to get out of the experience, um, but it's not, hey, Monday at 9 a.m. Uh, and I'm done with all my social media at 11 a.m. You know, it's Monday 9 to 9.05. Tuesday might be one o'clock, Thursday might be two o'clock, whatever that is, but you wanna kind of make sure, hey, am I spending my time online building my audience building who I want to go to. So when I have an experience to sell or I'm somewhere, people are going to be like, oh yeah, I saw you. I'm following you, blah, 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 blah. And then lastly, I just recommend um, there is real no commercial interest to be on Twitter. Um, Twitter has become this very venomous, uh, hate it, hate it even more. There's not even a lot of space for love on Twitter. It's just gone down some rabbit holes. Pinterest, I put up as a cautionary tale. Um, Pinterest is, unfortunately, if you sell some amazing, unique one-offs, Pinterest tracks who buys what and how much it sold for. So if you've become pretty successful and Pinterest recognizes it, Pinterest is going to start selling it to higher volume, larger conglomerates that they basically say, oh, we'll sell you these 10,000 widgets this person's making and we'll reincorporate it under our label and then we'll sell them. So just always want to make sure that as you, if, if Pinterest is a selling platform, um, just keep an eye on that. Uh, that's all I really got to say about the web. We can go to the next slide. Can I touch on something real fast? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, from an event coordinator and vendor standpoint, um, so if you are searching for our Facebook events. Um, I know from a, an event coordinator standpoint, I mostly use Facebook groups in regards to searching for actual events. Um, he is Tim is totally right in the fact in regards to selling your product and marketing your product. Instagram is that because Instagram is very focused on visual photos. Um, Facebook groups because there's so much more um, in information, like there's so much more word driven. Um, Facebook groups are often where the events themselves that you're searching for are going to be located. Um, we will talk a little bit later in regards to um, some of the things to look for in making sure that those are legitimate um, events, but that is where you're typically going to find events, um, mostly because I know on our page, we don't want to post a bunch of flyers to saturate the product that we're selling in our store. Um, and so that's why Facebook groups become really handy. Um, also, I just wanted to throw out there that this 
um, this presentation overall is not just focused on supporting you in retail therapy events. This was designed to help you um, with the vendor community in general. Um, so whether it's our events or someone else's events, this will be very beneficial to you. Thank you, Erica. So just before I go to the next slide, I'm like multitasking and um and when do you see just my presentation slides or because I'm also clicking on the chat just to make sure we're not missing, but do you see when I'm moving in the toggling between chat? No? Okay. No, so you're perfect. You're doing great. Yeah, so actually um right, recognizing that we are saying like get on social media and increase your visibility, put your brand out. That is that, you know, while yes, we're putting and sharing our brand with the world, that's also creating more risk, right, um, as well. And so I'll leave, um, pass it to back to Erica to share a little bit more about while there's so many benefits to being on social media and building your digital footprint, how do we also um, be cautious as well? Yeah, so we've actually only been hosting events for a little bit over a year, so we're still very new um, to the vendor community. I, I think a year is still very new. We're still learning a lot, um, but one of the things that we learned very quickly is that social media is a huge window for people to take advantage of people who are not knowledgeable about what to look for on social media. It is so easy for people to create fake profiles and to try and scam vendors. And because in the small business community, a lot of us are new, a lot of us are extremely excited for opportunities, and they will um, prey on that. So I wanted to go over some of the red flags um, and things to look for. Um, and as I said, we utilize Facebook groups often as event coordinators to post events, but that is also the primary space I've seen um, vendors being scammed. What it means to be scammed quite often is what a person will do is they will go and create a fake Facebook page. Um, they will often screenshot um, another event coordinator's um, flyer, and they will portray themselves as the event coordinator for that event. This is not just with retail therapy. This is in um, something we've seen. If you're in those Facebook groups, you see a lot of conversations about scammers. So I just wanted to lay out a few things to look for. And then also a few things that we do that maybe you can let your other event coordinators know that, um, that really helps support our vendors. Uh, if it looks fishy, uh, do your research. So you always want to contact the admins of your Facebook group if you're unsure if that's a legitimate event. You can always call the venue and check and make sure that that event is actually taking place. It is very rare that an event coordinator will um, in direct message you, so send you a personal message in regards to sending you an application or asking you for money. Uh, typically, they need to send you an invoice or have you pay through their website, um, which is what we do. Um, hopefully, you guys are asking questions to other vendors. Um, the, the, there's just a, a lot of, I, I just say, if you're unsure, make sure you're doing your research. One of the best Facebook groups that really takes care of their vendors, I have found is, um, I always want to make, I always mix up, it's Arizona spelled out vendors. Um, that group constantly um, monitors before they post the event. They they make sure that that event is a legitimate event with a legitimate event coordinator. Um, you can also always click on the name of the person that is posting the event. And oftentimes it's very obvious that they are a fake profile. Um, they have very few friends. They were, a page was just created. Um, and oftentimes once they're caught, they block their page and then they try to do it with another fake profile. So um, we hate to see vendors and small businesses um, be scammed out of money. That is definitely the last thing an event coordinator ever wants for their vendors. Um, some of the things that we do, so that way you can continue to educate other event coordinators who might be new, we're very specific in where we put our logo on our flyer. We do not put our logo at the bottom because we don't want someone else to just be able to crop that out. So we actually will put our logo somewhere in the middle of our flyer, so that way it's hard to crop. Um, we solely go on to, um, we, we, 
are only doing signups and payment through our website now. Um, so we will never be like, oh, what's your PayPal, your Cash App, your Venmo? Those are huge red flags if that's what they're asking for in regards to payment. I would definitely do your research if someone's using those platforms for payment. Um, what else do we do? Obviously, our brand, we're very, very present on social media. So people typically always will be like, hey, um, is this event with you? So luckily, and hopefully the other event coordinators are also extremely present in marketing that people know their name and um, who the event is with. But we just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that this is a this is a real thing on the internet of people trying to take advantage of you um, and just to be ahead of the game. Thank you, Erica. I for sure, when you and I were talking about this, that was definitely my first time ever hearing about it. And when I shared with Tim, we, uh, he was also surprised as well, too. So thanks for sharing. And again, Absolutely. not to scare anyone or, you know, or to create any, you know, shyness around being a vendor, but just, you know, again, uh, being aware, aware and informed. <clears throat> So what happens during um, during the vendor um, being in the booth in the mar in the market? So you get 40 to 45 to 60 second seconds when someone comes in and approaches your booth in your space. And this really is going to determine the sales opportunity. So you definitely want to have already prepared what like what to say, like what you do, why you do it. And this is an opportunity for you to really highlight what makes your your product unique and really sharing your story, right? It's your time to shine and flaunt your flaunt your product. So it's important that you you think about this beforehand, um, right? So that way you know what has been what works for you as well, too. And I think another piece to note here is um the the self awareness piece I know I've heard stories with, um or or before even I before I even say this like what what are some of the things that uh, that when you go to a market what are some of the things some experiences that you do you do like from vendors and what are some of the experiences that maybe you don't you don't like what have you noticed when you go to markets. I know for me going to the markets, if somebody's like hollering like across somebody else's booth and trying to get your attention, I, I don't know. That's just not my thing. We always wait till they're like within a certain distance of our booth and that they're within a certain range. So we're not taking from our other vendor partners as well. Um, I think that's very helpful. And it, it I think it, you get a little bit more respect that way I think a lot of people will pay a little more attention than if you're hollering like 90 feet out trying to get somebody's attention yeah just just my personal preference and what about when you are not not being the vendor so much but you being a consumer at a market what are some same, of the same. I, yeah, I don't like someone just hollering from super far away trying to get your attention you know what I mean like yeah. if I'm like within range then okay we're good but if I'm like halfway down the aisle that just I don't know it turns me off I don't want to I don't want to go because it seems like you're trying too hard to get me in there and I don't you know it's just not my thing <laughs> yeah. thank you Lori anyone else wanted to add I wanted to add that um, what I found as a, a vendor is that you literally just need to be friendly like hey happy you know happy Mother's Day if you're there for Mother's Day or whatever you know but you're you're just, just get their attention enough to have them turn and look. I mean, you're not even, most people I've found right now are literally just trying to see what's go going on, but they're really tight fisted. And so you just need to be friendly and have them, have them look and, and add to their positivity in the day. And even if they don't come in or if they do come in and you just have a conversation they might come back around or they'll come back around the next time because you were nice because you were friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We remember how people make us feel for sure. Um, and so, you know, I love what, I love what you were both brought forth, right? Because we have the, I think there's a discernment skill that is needed when we're at an, um, when we're at the, in our booths, right? Like how do we, 
how right because we could have the the vendor who is on their phone right while when we approach them and they're just like texting looking down and then we can have the other the other end like Lori brought up where they're hollering us from the other side of the of the market or one of my one of my colleagues told me that a lady put there like she had her hands full and the lady just came up to her and put her business card in her in her purse right <laughs> so again it's like right how do we discern have that self-awareness of how we show up with with our um with our customers in that moment as well too so definitely a lot of self-awareness and and really you know thinking about like who you know how you want to show up um in those spaces Erica, i always so like to say that Oh, I'm sorry. I always <laughs> like to say, like, think of your booth as your store during that time. If I walk into a store and the person working there is just sitting behind the desk, I'm going to feel that energy. Like I, I, I'm really big on, and I get the summer's going to be hot. It's a, a vending is not easy. Trust me. I've vended before I hosted events and I will say, I know how hard vending is. I don't necessarily miss it um, because I know the work that goes behind vending. I know how much work it is to haul all your stuff and set up and to really not know what that event is going to hold. But I will say you have to stay present. You cannot get discouraged after your first hour or if the whole event doesn't bring a sale because it could bring a connection. It could bring a conversation. Um, and Alejandra is going to go over some other things that you can do to continue that interaction with the connections you made. So um, try and stay off your phone unless it's promoting your, your business and your presence at the market. Um, try and be aware and alert of who is walking by. Um, try and stand for as much as you can. Um, because I just feel like when I'm walking by a booth, those are the vendors that I am more um, drawn to go have a conversation with. Yes, thank you. I'll just add a quick note. You made up a good point. Um, yes, Laura's one step ahead of me. Bring a comfortable chair. Um, <laughs> it it sounds a little cheesy, but it is work. You're there, you know, usually an hour and a half before the the market is open to the public, and you're usually there after an hour and a half trying to close down and coordinate. So yes, it is work. Um, comfortable shoes please no you know sexy shoes to <laughs> be behind the booth they won't last very long um so yeah just yeah that's just good the sexy shoes and sometimes they won't yeah. even see it because you'll be behind the table the whole time unless you're one of those that likes to be in front of the booth as well too and stay hydrated um there's also some really non like not expensive water mister fans for this summer i i mean we're heading into summer find ways get the wraps that go around your neck um get the mister fans they do cause a lot of i mean i've had my product like soaked by those so position them um correctly but it's going to be hard this summer but there are some incredible markets still um that will allow your business to continue to have business in the summer um so just you have to find ways to make sure that you're healthy because obviously, if you're about to pass out, you're not going to um, perform at your best potential. So, and you really won't be able to sell. <laughs> uh, just real quick on these displaying techniques, I want to um, ask Alejandro to go to the next slide, and I'll kind of highlight exactly how these um, are incorporated. Um, it's interesting for a booth versus a tabling. So this is a tabling event, and your retail space is literally the table. In booth experiences, it's a little bit different, and it does make it does matter a little bit. Um, pulling the table back into your booth, let somebody walk into your store. Um, you don't need three six foot tables. If you have a ten by ten, break it up. Do a four foot table. Maybe do a, a bistro table. If you have something in particular to highlight, maybe it's jewelry, um, and then maybe your big table where you're doing your commerce or, or stuff like that be brand aware um you know this particular these folks i mean look at that you it screams legitimacy it screams that they're you know in it to win it they've got that, you know who knows what they're selling i can't see it out but it's very very aware that they're a, a working business what i really liked about this is that they also have a sign up sheet it's incredibly uh easy to get a qr code um and you can just have that qr code printed and on your uh, table 
and you, you can ask folks, hey, just QR code me and then they'll get your social media handles or start following my website, join my email list, however those things are um, to engage or go old school, pen and paper. And just, that's also a really great point. If somebody, we all deal looky, looky lose and they're like, oh, this is really great. Oh, okay. Well, you're not going to buy it today, but can I get your name and number? Um, and that's just going to build your market um, and then all that stuff. Uh, the next slide. This is a great example of uh, just a different way. And I, what I really like is that she's using different levels. Um, and that's a really great way to kind of increase your retail space, have a couple different levels of experience. Like we've all, depending on your age, I've been to the mall and you kind of always did the window shopping, right? It wasn't just flat with some things there. It was always different uh, things. If you sell clothes, maybe you have a teddy bear or something like that, that you're selling your hats on, um, anything like that. Again, the sign up sheep is there. They've got a product sample if that's relevant to your booth experience. Um, and again, with the branded image, um, next one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Before that one. I just really want to, um, for the booth experience, experiment with it. It doesn't always have to be the same all the time. It can be different based on, you know, what you think might sell. Maybe it's a, it's a one of those um, mannequins that you want to sell the cool towels because everybody's going to be hot. I would also recommend um, making it easy for somebody to buy something and leave. You know, don't have baggies, um, even if it's the recycled, uh, you know, grocery bags, there's a million of them all over the place. You know, a lot of times in booths, what, we, what we've seen at Local First is people want to enjoy themselves and they want to keep walking around. And so if, if you're selling clunky things or stuff that might be heavy, definitely offer, hey, I'll purchase it. Here's your bag. I'll staple it, put your name all over it and you can come back. Um, so we encourage those sort of like engagements. I also just really want to add that um, be relevant to your market and what you're selling. We do the fall festival once a year. We get about 15,000 people showing up. And a lot of times it's uh, families that are there to see if there's a, a spontaneous purchase. Um, so we discourage people from bringing furniture. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to go to a festival and purchase a large item. Maybe they don't want to spend two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, maybe it's not glassware unless you've got it really great packaged and then they can take it away from you. If you are in the space of clothing, um, it goes a long way, I think, just to get a bunch of tissue paper and wrap up the clothing you just purchased and put that into the to the bag. It's it doesn't it just lets people know that, hey, you're, you're buying something of quality. Um, I'm taking the time to wrap it for you and send it off on its way. Any questions about booth displays or booth engagement in the group? All right. Quiet, quiet folks here on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and I'm not even drinking water. Usually I'd be drinking something else. But... I have a comment on that. Yes. So I have, um, when I do my booths, I have my doormats and my doormats are really um, quirky and funny and people read them and they crack up and then they, they walk away. Um, I also have resin art that I do as well, but I like to have the doormats because they're, they are bigger items and it needs more room to display them, I put them up front and then my resin I have like kind of in my booth, but I find that it's difficult or, you know, people don't come actually in the booth to see the resin art. They just read the the mats and they're interested in the mats. So, you know, how do you combat that? Well, you know, they're reading, but you also want them to come in and look at the other stuff that you do. <laughs> I would kind of experiment with flipping the format. Maybe the resin is in is is in the front, and then and the the engagement piece is oh right behind me. Are <laughs> all these great yeah. mats, or even something circular? Like if you could do a circle bistro table in the center, and then your your mats are 
or surrounding that, you know, so they're not stepping on it, you would lose retail space, but at least people would be engaged seeing your mat. Um, anything, Erica, that came to mind? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think also even having the mats kind of on the side behind you because they're still going to read them and that's not necessarily something that they need to touch um or that they're gonna you know it's definitely something that you can you know give to them if there's a way that you can utilize even your tent walls i i know because i know your mat so they they might be a little heavy but there are some type of ways to kind of like do some type of display that's utilizing the wall space of your tent um and then utilize your retail space more for the small takeaway items um, I also know that as Tim was talking about like the heavy and bulky stuff, this to me, it, it goes for both retail spaces and for vendor booth, um, experiences. A lot of you do custom work. A lot of you can't display everything you do, but you can utilize those markets and your retail spaces to, um, to promote the fact that you do custom pieces. Um, it's, it's using that time also as a marketing tool to make sales maybe outside of your vendor booth experience or your retail space where you are limited on space. Um, make sure you're utilizing signage um, to say that I do custom pieces or like what you see today, want me to customize one for you. Um, here's how you contact me. Um, I hosted a private vendor experience on Thursday and she was selling these big, beautiful cutting boards and she didn't make any sales that day, but she got six custom orders. So that vendor experience was still extremely worth it to her because she got work outside of, you know, the, the space. So um, it's just finding ways to, you're right, like like looking at your product and seeing what is going to be the best use of space. Um, and also what is my goal at this market if I don't make a physical sale that day? And I would, I would explore looking at QR codes. So if you do have somebody in there and maybe that you're one of the first booths that they go by, they don't want to purchase it and, and lug around uh, uh, maybe a, a full size, I have visions of a full size doormat. But um, being able to purchase it, and if you can say, hey, great, you can buy it right now, I'll put it in a behind the, my table or whatever. Or if you could explore, um, shipping might be a little pricey given the weight, but you could look at, or say, hey, I purchase it, that'll be at the retail therapy store, uh, come pick it up next week. So I definitely want to encourage purchasing <laughs> and then figuring out logistics, uh, but giving folks the options that way they can kind of get excited about the humor of your, of your items and then be like, oh yeah, that'd be cool, I'll buy it, um, so. Um, hi guys, awesome, thank you. let me go back a little bit, if you don't mind, Tim, I'd like to uh, go back to the display and how you should set that, how you should set up your table. Um, I do gift baskets um, and they come in various sizes, but the majority of them are bulky. So looking at the table that you have on the display there, if you can kind of give me an example of how I would set that up, um, because it's kind of difficult for me when I have you know, something big like, like a gift basket. What I normally do is I'll put the, the basket itself on the table and then right in the center, I would have a, a crate where I would put the larger basket on top or the larger gift on top of the crate. So it's above all of the other baskets. So what do you recommend for that? And I hope I'm explaining it, you know, well enough. I, I, I believe so. I, I think, we're, thank you for the question. I think there's a couple of things. Um, being... Like, yeah, I, I might even discourage a table unless it's a very small table, just so you can have somebody purchase something, put it on the small table, and then you can make the point of sale. I would look at um, coat racks, shelves, um, something that can be eye level shelves or hanging, um, because you don't want to make it too high where people can't see what they're purchasing, but you want to encourage them to grab the basket, right, and look into it. Um, those we have a couple of vendors um and I, i'll share this with erica she can get it to you specifically with uh, different examples of um there's pegboards as well that are really really uh cheap and they're i shouldn't say cheap they're they look good they're durable but you would never like uh you know put it in your family living room type of stuff 
but it's it is um, a pegboard that will allow you to slot different things. You can put shelves on it or just have hooks. That would be something I would kind of explore. Um, yeah, I think we could definitely um, help you with that. Erica, do you have something to? The, um, the wooden crates at Michael's too, you can stack them to make a shelving display and put your gift bags, baskets inside them on top of them and make like cool dimensions. Um, the other thing that people love at a vendor market is they love an experience. And so for me, like I love to go like, like I, I like, and they like custom work. Cause that's the thing is a lot of you create custom pieces. So you might want to have some of your gift bag baskets that are already created um, to give an example. And then you might want to just have a, almost like a build your own gift basket experience where they're paying for the product. And then right there, you, you put it into a basket, bag it up and, and, and make it look beautiful. Um, I was watching someone do that the other day at our mother's day, um, a private shopping event and she got so many sales just because they got to literally pick out the, her two candles two candles she put them into a box she had this beautiful scarf and she just wrapped it right in front of them and it was the experience of getting to pick two candles and have it custom for her um she was selling like crazy so i'm um, just thinking of those ways it, it you don't always have to go big if you can create an experience for that customer something that, that stands out amongst the other vendors and something we didn't really uh talk too much about is um know your know your neighboring vendors like uh in particular for for gift baskets right if you were just either you or, or somebody that's helping you that day if you can walk around real quick and say hey if you purchase something from the the market that day we do gift baskets if you want to add a customizable x um definitely i encourage a lot of cross pollination um if you think about it right like if you if you were next to the, the woman that was selling the doormats right you know hey you're buying stuff for a home warming gift or something like that um come check out my my gift baskets you know we've got uh, or vice versa go see that person so definitely encourage the community of vendors to be vendor um, united is <laughs> an interesting way to say it, because the more that everybody can reference folks or, hey, I don't have that, but this person does, it's just a great way to build community within the vendor network. And we've got one vendor that is a boutique store and she quickly learned that, that hey, if I show up 15 minutes early, the, the family that puts up their booth has two boys <laughs> that are teenagers and they walk around and they help all the uh, people set up booths. So little things like that, I think are really important when it comes to um, the spender experience as well. So in the vein of what happens after, right? What's the after party gonna look like? And so so we're done uh, with with that event. Definitely giving yourself space to celebrate. And you know, like Erica mentioned, that even if sometimes we don't make a sale, like what, you know, what else was created as well too. And so we talked about the, you know, having the QR code or also um and Right. Sometimes I, I invite you all to have the QR code and also so in the sign in sheet just in case sometimes our phone service is slow, right? Like, oh, they tell us, oh, I can't log on right now or I can't I can't get to your QR code. It's okay, right? S still sign up right here. But making sure we follow up with those signups, right? Mom, maybe sending a thank you, thank you note. Um Encourage them to, you know, if possible, encourage them to provide feedback on the spot as well, too. Those QR codes are definitely that space to do that. And so I really invite you all to definitely do a Google My Business page before you start getting into your markets, because maybe what if you have such a wonderful conversation with with a, a buyer and, you know, they're saying really nice things uh, um, already about your product um, and about your the experience, can you know just ask him like you know I really appreciate what you just shared. Can you please take just one minute to to write that on Google? And so that that could be an opportunity for you to put the QR code, and they can scan it and they can write what they they just reiterate what they just said 
right? So to um, so definitely encourage the feedback and continue to engage on social media, right? There's a lot of different opportunities here. Maybe you know showing pictures or reels, right, of how the the whole event went. Maybe promote um, asking some of your customers to post, you know, your product whether it's like eating it or wearing it, right? But encouraging, you know, the, um, the customers to also post it and tagging you and you being able to um, um, re-tag it in your, uh, repost it in your social media page, as well as um, re reflecting, right? Every experience will be different. And so there's so much to learn. And so really highlighting what worked well for me in this experience and then also, Asking that hard question, like what didn't go well, because that's a, also a learning a space as well um, for for you all as well to to kind of pivot in the next um, um, in the next vendor market in the next vendor experience for sure. For and for and and I'll open it up to you all. Like, what do you like to do when you're closing out an event? What are some of the best practices that you have established? So usually I will, um, at the end of every market and we're home and we've unloaded and done all our paperwork and the stuff we need to do, typically I'll send a social media blast out, thanking anyone who came and saw us. So I'll call out individual people if we know them, um, you know, just do a big blast out and thank everybody and talk about how fun the market was and, you know, try and get people to go, oh, we missed out. That should have sounded like a fun one. You know what I mean? Because then they'll want to come the next time around. Um, we do a live. Oops. Not only us, but it helps our vendor partners. It helps the whole market in general. So we do that as well. So typically afterward, I'll go back through and I'll tag all of those vendors so that people, because people will watch those later. And a lot of times they'll engage with some of those vendors. They'll engage with us. They'll come to the market the next time around and they'll say, oh yeah, we saw your live. And that's been helping that we work with that are doing the same thing. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I love that, Lori. I think that that was the piece that's a part of the piece that Tim was talking about, the cross-pollination of the vendors, right? And and if you are tagging other vendors um, or maybe even commenting on others, that also kind of boosts your algorithm as well too and reaches you know, their clients and vice versa as well. Ex exactly right so they'll share our live video because it features them in it and then people have come and found us and said hey we saw you on so-and-so's page you're live from a couple weeks ago when we wanted to come see what you had so it does work because i've had people come and tell me so it's pretty cool um, one thing that i know that i pay, always pay attention to is like if i ever do buy a, a product from someone i love the little stickers that say like oh thank you for supporting a small business and then like it has the the handles to the social media and literally 100% of the time I will go on social media and will add them as well too. So that's definitely another, um, you know, kind of another layer, right, for the engagement for the and the after party that you, uh, we can all take on. Tim, I saw I, you on mute. Oh, go ahead, Eric. No, no, no. I, I saw both of you guys go on mute. On mute so. <laughs> um, I've been going on Amazon and getting this pack of 300 um, raffle tickets for $10 that have it already written out for name e and email. Um, and I have been having all of my, um, at my informational booths, having um, the community fill these out. One, you're collecting their email just like that. So you're that's a fun interactive way to build your email list. And then I do a raffle Um following the market live on social media. Um, and so that way you're getting them to want to follow you on social media and engage in your page. And in that live, you can then thank them so much for coming, um, introduce when your next market is going to be, where they can find you this week, um, and you can engage with them. And then obviously um, you can post your live. So anyone who missed it in the actual live moment can then go back and um and watch it on your page. So that's just like a kind of a good way to 
um, do two things at once of building your email list, uh, creating that engagement after the market. And I love finding things that are already pre-made for me. I did learn the other day in a local first presentation though, that I'm going to stop shopping on Amazon because I'm not supporting my local community. <laughs> so, <laughs> so next I'll find a local vendor to create me awesome <laughs> raffle tickets. <laughs> we'll, we'll be editing the recorded version. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle, it's a it's a great point. And in this conversation, I realize that we'll probably offer an additional training to this one, which is how to build your audience once you've kind of got a couple of vendor booth experiences under under your belt. When it comes to the thank you notes, it's never too late to send a thank you note. Um, I would kind of lean on what uh, Erica was saying, get some pre-printed ones um, and just if it can be pre-printed, it says, thank you for shopping my shop, maybe your Instagram handle, your website, and then all you got to do is sign it. Thank you. So when you're purchasing it, you can just put it in the card um, and they have your information. Um, when it comes to, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a, a soapbox. When it comes to collecting emails and getting customer information, please, please, please do not just put them um, on, a, on a desk somewhere and, and let them not be money for you. Every person that takes the time to register for your social medias, to follow you, to give you their information, that's all potential customers. So just make sure that you're getting all that information, have a system that works for you, that within a certain amount of time from your event, let's say a, a week and a half at the most, you're putting that information into your customer management system. If you don't have one, please reach out to us. We have some cheat sheets in Excel that will help you kind of muddle through um, communications or usually your website has stuff. But just absolutely want to encourage um, the thank you, the pre-sale. Hey, I want to be again at this location, especially if you knocked that out of the ballpark. Um, there's a lot of little markets. You'll do great on some. You won't do great on others. You might sell a particular product and, you know, send out another email blast to the existing customers for whatever reason, something might've worked and be like, Hey, everybody, I got this in stock right now. Um, I got a special summer special, whatever those things are. Um, definitely, definitely get those, uh, thank you cards out. Thank you emails. Um, I don't think people ever get tired of supporting a local business. And I think it's a lot of what Local First tries to do. Um, and I use my story as an example. I had a construction company and I found myself taking meetings at Starbucks. And I was like, well, how can I convince people to take uh, an opportunity for a local business if I'm you know, supporting a, a, a global business? So we don't say no, never to Amazon, but we do say, is there something local that we can um, source that from? And does it work for me at that time? So definitely, definitely um, uh, send the thank yous and build up your, your customer base. Those are your future customers. And then use that email list also. You can send out before your market some type of promotion that you're doing at that market specifically. You can also post a coupon on your social media and say, show this coupon um, at my booth today and get so-and-so. Um, and I, Lori, I did read your message about not having public information out on the table and just making your um, shoppers feel comfortable um, and that it's a safe environment. So I think the raffle tickets are a really good avenue to utilize because it's just going into a bowl and it's not public to everyone everybody. Um, I also love when I hear that vendors are using the markets um, for their customers throughout the week to come pick up custom orders. That is such a smart way to get people to come to the market. Um, also giveaway items. And I did, I forget to mention earlier, I know we talked a lot about Instagram and Facebook and what to use them for, but the mommy groups on Facebook are definitely somewhere that you should be promoting your presence. And if you can engage something with the kids, the kids bring the moms and the dads. So we do a lot of stuff like that at the store. Um, like this summer, we're doing free craft night every Wednesday. And the purpose of that is to get the families to come into the store. Um, so if you have free stickers for the kids today or free lollipops for the kids today or just something simple um, to engage um, getting the families to come out for sure. Thank you. All good ideas.
So we're wrapping up here our presentation, um, but before I go into the slide, is there anything that anybody wanted to share or any questions? Any aha moments? I just put in the chat that Local First um, does a lot of small business consulting. That's the team um, Alejandra and I are a part of. So if you went through this and you're like, man, I wish I could get some extra help in this, that's definitely a space that um, we provide. Um, as I said, we are a nonprofit, so we do offer these um, consulting opportunities at no cost. Uh, myself and Alejandro are part of the consulting team. Um, so definitely if there's um, things that you want to come back to us on or reach out to us, uh, we are definitely here to help the local business uh, environment. I'm going to steal this uh, slide from Alejandra, but I um, want to make sure that we are aware of some really amazing upcoming events. We have Indie Week, which is a statewide um, platform that's got a bingo card. We absolutely encourage businesses um, we'll get a lot of media presence, we'll get a lot of um, interviews, and we'll see people, um, we're working on getting influencers, love them or hate them, they're out there, <laughs> influencers in the wild. Um, we're going to have bingo cards and say, you know, buy from a local vendor, go to a coffee shop, um, go to a farmer's market, whatever those things are, people can fill these cards in and then put uh, submitted to um, us for some really great raffle prizes. We have concerts, um, swag bags, all that kind of stuff. So Indie Week is gonna be the week of July, obviously for uh, the Dependence Week, um, but please be aware of that. Um, and then we'll get that information to Erica so she can um, send it off uh, to her network. We also have something called the Good Food Expo. That is an opportunity if you are in the sale of food and you want to say, hey, can I get into grocery stores? Um, can I get into um, mercados or smaller uh, bodegas? Um, that's an opportunity to go and basically it's having a booth in front of people that are out to go and purchase um, food products and have them stock. A good example is Duck and Decanter. If you've ever been there, the, it's a little bit of sandwiches and a lot of bit of retail. Um, so they, they're a really good local uh, supporter. We also offer a retail boot camp um, and, a re and a restaurant boot camp. These are our incubator programs. So if you are, or you know somebody that's thinking about um, getting into the food business, um, we can help you kind of get that solid acumen, job costing, efficiencies, uh, permitting, path, all that stuff. We can help you with that. And a retail boot camp, which we're really, really excited about. We're launching Ari uh, Arizona. Local First has a shop local website, and we're in the process of absolutely um, relaunching it uh, to encourage folks to visit stores of local businesses. So we'll have a really great directory. People can say, oh, jewelry, um, home accessories, and then hopefully your shop's got great photography. It'll pop up. But we're going to have um, one of our experts, her name is Sophia. She just started. She just joined our team. Um, she's going to help navigate um, in, in her own boot camp what it's like to be an online retail. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, as more information comes out, we will definitely let uh, you folks know, but that's something to uh, keep an ear out. It's all marketed by local first. So think of it as a way to have passive marketing that you're absolutely not in charge of. Um, we are doing all that push. And so people can say, oh, yeah, I saw you on the local first site. Um, so that's really exciting for coming up. And finally, we do, as we're coming into summer, let's think about fall. <laughs> we have our local first fall festival, which is the state's largest um, festival of event. We'll have about 15,000 people come in. It's on a Saturday, uh, I think November 4th. Um, it's not 1,500, it's uh, 15,000. But we will have just an, a massive amount of folks there um, so we're starting to get that ball rolling. It is application for our members. Um, so you will have to be a member of Local First uh, to participate, but highly encourage it. It's just a really great way to get your name out there. Again, we'll have a lot of um, media presence um, and help us to push that along. And that's kind of the space that Local First wants to, to play in. We don't want to sell t-shirts. We want to help you sell t-shirts. Um, so that's really our, our wheelhouse, um, just to be that that machine that's out there 
um, helping the local businesses. And <laughs> thank you, Alexa, for stealing. <laughs> yeah, and no, no worries. And the dates missing was totally on me. But now that I think I did that intentionally, so that way you can all visit our website and check out for more. <laughs> I'm applying what we're learning here. <laughs> and so that wraps it up, team. Um, as um, Tim mentioned, we are part of the entrepreneurial support team. So we can work with you on a one-to-one -one basis. And so please take my email down. Or if you don't um, get my email, you can always ask Erica for it as well, too. Um, and feel free to reach out. Um, usually it starts with a conversation about, you know, what you know, what is going on? What are your goals and your dreams? And also what are those pain points? And then from there, we can definitely strategize on where to take it next to really support next to really support your business goals too. Speaking as a member of Local First, um, you'll hear me talking a lot through our platform about advocating to join Local first because a lot of these workshops are very general they're for the broad audience um and so then when you become a member of local first you can dive in one-on-one -on -one, um for really getting the support that you specifically need for your business and they truly stand by what they say and being a support system um we have been able to get an incredible mentor in regards to social media um i know a lot of people are like you're doing great on social media she's made me notice so many things that i didn't know um i've been able to get support on um accounts services. I've been able to get support on the retail aspect. Um, really anything, you just have to advocate for yourself and your business the support you need because they do have the resources. Um, the e-commerce side is huge for small businesses, especially during summer when things slow down. So to be able to have um, Local First who has a huge following, already have an e-commerce for local businesses is a huge, huge opportunity. So um, please please consider learning more about their their platform and you'll hear about them a lot through myself because I'm kind of obsessed now so <laughs> um, I know some of you are exiting um, I'm sure all of you are already on our email list if you heard about this um, workshop today but definitely make sure to follow us um, because we're always posting new opportunities as well yes and I and I have my homework to look up a local business that does um, raffle tickets. <laughs> so connect them. <laughs> That's how we also work is we want to connect all of you to each other and keep all the, the monies here locally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all, guys.